Hey, welcome everyone. I'm so delighted to welcome our speaker, Arvind Gupta. Arvind is a thought leader and practitioner in investing in building companies at the intersection of biology and tech. He currently co-leads Mayfield Fund's engineering biology practice, whose mission is to invest in science-based companies that could change history, ranging from reinventing our food systems to stopping climate change to novel therapeutics. Um, Arvind was, uh, you know, has an amazing investment uh, track record, and he was the first investors in breakout companies such as New Culture, DNA Light, and Memphis Meats, which I'm sure we've all heard of. Um, he's also the co-founder of Indie Bio, which is the world's first accelerator devoted to startups using biology to solve the world's most challenging problems. As founder, he redefined the pace and possibilities of early stage biotech, working with founders such as yourselves to invest in uh, companies and help grow them and scale them into uh, global leaders and um, you know, exceeded the portfolio to over $3 billion in value. Arvind is also a writer. You ask him, how does he find the time? Uh, he recently published Decoding the World, a roadmap for, for the questioner. Um, he was honored with the F50 Global Awards for impact in health tech innovation and a frequent speaker in major tech conferences such as TechCrunch Disrupt in a media such as Bloomberg News, Forbes, um, and also uh, serves as a less, uh, guest lecturer at leading universities such as UCSF, MIT, and Harvard. Now, something really cool about Arvind, he's also so a base jumper and uh, a big wall climber and now fights professional grappling. So to learn more, you, you got to dig into his book um, and, and he holds eight patents. So Arvind's going to share with us his five essential moments in building a biotech company and how biotech is a hundred uh, trillion dollar opportunity to solve global challenges such as climate change, healthcare, and food system issues. So with that, take it away, Arvind. Thank you, Victoria. Well, thank you for the lovely introduction. So um, we don't have much time, so I'm going to just blast into it, guys. So uh, I know that, um, first of all, congratulations for all of you guys getting to the finals of um, the Extreme Tech Challenge. I think highly of this competition, which is why I'm spending my time here. Um, and so I'm going to generalize this to not just biotech, but for all companies, because the five essential moments of a biotech startup apply to everyone equally. So I'll go ahead and um, let's see, share my screen. Hold on, let's see, share screen. So uh, you heard a little bit about me. It's nice to meet you all. Uh, Four billion people are coming out of poverty in the next 20 years, along with the world population spike equals five Earths of demand and one Earth of supply. That simple uh, dilemma is going to drive the majority of change um, over the next 25 to 50 years. Uh, and that change is $100 trillion of opportunity. And so if we don't reinvent how we make things, how we, how we deliver the, the things that everyone wants, uh, we're going to run out of the resources that are, that are required. So the first moment of uh, all startups is finding the problem, OK? Um, and I always say this because most founders, most scientists, most people focus on the solution that they've created to something, right? Um, that's the, that's the hammer finding a nail problem, right? Find the actual problem and then you'll be able to, uh, to solve it. And so what is a, what is a problem? What is a great problem? A great problem, you know, unifies the world. A great problem has focus. In other words, you can, it's not like we're going to solve world hunger, Right? Like that's not, that, that doesn't have focus, right? Um, wh what is the actual customer pain point that you're going to need to solve that unlocks it? And again, you're all technologists, extreme, you know, the extreme challenge solve the technology, the technology actually doesn't matter relative to the problem. So it, as long, and this is a story, all of these slides have stories, which I'm not going to um, have time to go through uh, today with you, but um, if you're doing a kidney, an artificial kidney, like is in the slide, it doesn't matter the technology that's going there. It just matters that you're able to dialyze blood inside the body. The second moment, founding the company. So now that you've identified a problem, right, that you want to go after, how do you do that? A CEO's job is twofold. One, build a product. Two, build a company. So to build a company, you have to start it. So you need a great team. The heart of great companies are teams. And at IndieBio, 
uh, Anne at Mayfield, I, I have this phrase that I call the bus test and it's rather macabre, but it's, it serves to illustrate a point. If one of the founders gets hit by a bus, if that company doesn't miss a beat, then it's not really a team of equals, right? And it fails the bus test. So you need a team that like, if, if one of the co-founders leaves, that's a big problem for the team. Uh, and so make sure that, you know, you never want to be the smartest person in the room, right? Because that means you're in the wrong room, especially when it's the company that you're trying to build. So build that team around you. Uh, great CEOs have a vision to create movements. Remember the first problem is a, a great problem can reunite the world. Well, a great CEO has to create the movement because that's explaining why the company exists. So that's Uma Valetti from Memphis Meats, now Upside Foods. Um, and early on, he was on magazine covers, building that movement. For CSOs or technical founders, they're obsessive about the underlying truth. So while the CEO is out there proselytizing, CSOs are getting to the bottom of the actual technology and problem and, uh, and making it happen. Along with the team, you want to have an incredible advisory board and plan for long term. When I see advisory boards filled with people that, yeah, kind of like, I can't recognize, that's a problem, right? They might be helpful, but the advisory board is to signal that people care, like that really good people, uh, best in the world, are lending their time and name to you. And that's really important. And yes, they can help you in ways that even if it's 10 minutes, that their experience will, will, will go a, a lot, a long way. This one's really important. Uh, I've watched more companies blow up for this, especially in scientific founding teams than anything else, a clean cap table. Um, really, <laughs> really important. There is a 5% max for non-full-time founding professors. Science-based teams, oftentimes the professor will say, hey, it's my idea. It was done in my lab. I should take 50%. Guess what? If you're not full-time, you don't get a lion's share of the equity because that is the only way to incentivize people to work all day, all night for no money is for the big payoff one day. And if most of it's sitting in a professor who's got a full-time job and doesn't really lend 100% of support to the company, that's not going to give you the fuel you need to survive. You want an ESOP, which is your option pool, uh, at least 10%. You want to make sure you've transferred your licenses. You've got for, found, uh, vesting for your founders four years with the one-year cliff as standard uh, and set up a Delaware C. The third moment is a shifted mindset. What does that mean? Well, that means going from scientist or technical technician to entrepreneur. How do you know you've got a, a shifted mindset? One, you understand that speed is safety. I was a mountaineer for 10 years, uh, rock climber, so... It was always, you know, we always talked about how, you know, the, the, the faster you can get up and off a mountain, the safer you are uh, because you're not going hit, to get hit by rockfall, objective. Same thing in startups. The faster you get to your milestones, the safer you are, the more runway you have, all of those things. You, you really want to be obsessive about your customers. Okay, that's the shifted mindset. Don't be obsessed about your technology, obsess about your customers. Build prototypes to discover the unknowns. Don't obsess around running experiments to be triply validated uh, you know, in the lab. Build prototypes to uncover fundamental truths that you don't even know exist. And then you gotta build business models that make sense and deliver actual value to the right people and your right customers. And it's not always obvious who they are. So the business model design is as critical, if not more critical than the technology um, in value creation. As a matter of fact, in our portfolio, anytime there's been a business model innovation, it's exponential value creation. If it's technological innovation, it's linear value creation. Finally, sales solves everything. You gotta really care about sales as your metric for success, not some number in the lab or some number, you know, like in your prototyping sales. Uh, this one goes out to all the scientists, right? Networking, you got to learn to love it. If you don't love networking, it's going to be really hard for you to succeed as an entrepreneur. 
Uh, networking gives you all the opportunities you don't have access to today. The fourth moment, dealing with crisis. You're gonna deal with crisis, so that's a moment. Communication is everything. Speak very, very clearly and openly between co-founders. If you don't do that, things could get wobbly very fast. And the second the team doesn't trust each other, investors certainly don't want to invest. Pivoting, shifting products. Uh, you got to quickly find out that New Wave Foods started with shark fin soup. No one really wanted to fake shark fin soup, so they quickly pivoted to shrimp and just recently received a large Series A financing from NEA. Don't fake it till you make it. Um, most importantly on the slide that I want to give, you know, everyone knows about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. The most important part is don't scale your problems. A lot of people will try to hide their problems or like, ah, you know, that problem will just go away in time. It doesn't. And when you take more money and you scale your company, that problem just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you don't solve your problem early on, it literally just grows with you. <laughs> it just becomes more and more expensive. I see this problem. I see this issue all the time. And then the fifth moment, funding the company, right? Whether it's seed, series A, series B, whatever, um, you need to finance the company because you're a startup and growth is what matters. And you're not looking for just profitability at a million dollars a year and run in, in um, revenues. You're looking to try to be large. So your current risk profile is your pre-money. What does that mean? That means if there's a ton of risk in your company, like this thing, who knows if it could work or not? I don't know. The team's never really done this before. All this kind of, That's going to be a very low pre-money valuation. Now, it doesn't matter how much I give you. $100 million, you got nothing but a paper plan. And well, that's going to be a $10 million pre-money, right? So that means you could finance your company very dilutively or very lean and you keep more of your company in doing so but taking more risk as you might run out of capital. So that's why you raise money to hit value inflection points rather than one lump sum bolus. Probably also someone's probably not going to give you a lump sum bolus. If they do, they're going to tranche it just like in Boston. And that's what I mean by the East Coast versus West Coast company building philosophy, although it's becoming more one coast right now um, where the East Coast is starting to do more founder-friendly terms and the West Coast is slowly like learning how to tranche <laughs> and do things that are more investor-friendly. So there's a real interesting blend here that's happening. But the most important part, what I say at IndieBio all the time and you know, I say to the portfolio companies all the time, rule number one of, of startups, don't die. Rule number two, get the best deal you can. See rule number one if you're ever in, in doubt about a deal, right? Like, so that's really important. And then when, you, when you're talking to VCs, VCs are never going to say no to you, just so you know. Like, they're going to be like, yeah, this is cool. Not enough data. Come back to me when you're... You got to tell them to say no because they're going to keep the optionality open. So run a process, talk to several VCs, create fear of missing out, FOMO, and get a VC to say sorry, we're not interested in you because then you get an answer and you no longer waste your time. So finally, the bonus moment is your purpose is your North Star. And what is purpose? I have a very simple phrase for what a purpose is. A purpose is the change you want to create in the world. That's it. And so as long as you know the change you want to create in the world, you have a guiding light that can help make sure that your decisions are... Uh, appropriate and um, in, the, in the right direction for what you've set out to do. So dare to build a radically innovative company, please. Um, it's something I am constantly looking for or founders with a lot of courage and bravery to not do the simple thing or the easy thing, but actually go and try to solve a, a world-sized problem uh, and um, use their use your own wits and resourcefulness to, uh, to make it happen. So thank you all. Um, I, I'll stop the presentation here and uh, we can just go into questions, which I think will be more interesting. Yeah, awesome, Arvin. All right, raise your hand or just jump in and ask your question. Hey, 
can you talk about some of the um, areas that's really exciting to you right now? Sure. Um, you know, something that I haven't invested in yet, but I want to is minerals and rare earth elements, uh, things that are going to support the electrification of the world. Uh, if you look at electric motors, if you look at batteries, if you look at all of these things, they require magnets and all sorts of weird, funky little elements, well, not little, big elements <laughs> that, that um, you got to dig out of the ground somewhere. So that's going to be an asymptotic rate limiter for the, for the shift to electric. Um, and you can't print more. It's not like a cryptocurrency or something like that. I can't just, or <laughs> you just can't like go run a printing press. So uh, I'm interested in, in technology that are getting uh, that stuff out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and and uh, here's a question. If you have a different business model and not the usual norm, you get so many no's as people don't get, uh, uh, don't have a reference point and you're in the process of a pivot. What is your suggestion? Find VCs that are open-minded and, uh, and really good. You know, bad VCs only know what they know. Good VCs are constantly evolving from the entrepreneurs they meet. That's my secret sauce, right? I'm, I'm the dumbest guy in the room always. And when, especially when entrepreneurs come to me, because when I see, uh, when I see a really interesting business model that's different, I'm like, why? That's really interesting. Like, that's cool. Um, there's gotta be something interesting in this value chain that is being unlocked. So my, my point would be, you know, especially if you have traction in that business model. So there's two things. One, go get traction in the business model and show it works. Two, go find VCs that are interested in, in blowing that traction up. Um, I got a company from a question from a company based in Singapore. Um, do you think they should set up a Delaware uh, C Corp to raise U.S. funding? <sighs> to raise U.S. funding, move to the U.S. You know, I think like that's the that that's kind of the the deal there. Um, you could make, be a Delaware C, but really very few. I mean, the world has gotten flatter with the whole Zoom thing, but I suspect, you know, that's not going to last, to be honest. Um, you know, any two years from now, it's not going to be like, we'll take a Zoom call and invest over Zoom, right? Um, I think if you want, build the ecosystem where you're at, that's critically important. Because if you have US investors, they're not going to help you in Singapore. How do they open up doors in the ministry of whatever and, customers and yeah, so go go build your your ecosystem where you want to be right then the next question would be move to the west coast or the east coast because <laughs> <laughs> i know you have presence in both i think the bay area is the best mm -hmm. it's still the the most founder friendly the most entrepreneurs um you know the talent is stacked it's the ecosystem that is the number one in the world. It's kind of like if you want to be a painter, right? You got, you're going to move to New York, right? Like if you make it, like it's, there are places where everything exists and you got, you go be successful there. Um, you could go to Boston, you could go to New York is, is starting to emerge, but I'd say the barrier. All right. I got a hand raised. Uh, let me find that hand. Oscar Espinoza, ask your question. Yeah. Arvin, thank you very much. Very uh, inspiring. And you said that, uh, well, the bonus is, is the North Star. What is, what is your North Star? To help uh, scientists and entrepreneurs truly solve for human and planetary health, avert climate change, and cure diseases for not just my children, but everyone's children and future generations. Like, that is the clearest North Star I could ever, like, that's the change. So all of you guys, like, I'm I am literally doing my purpose right now, which is to help you guys, help equip you guys to be able to go out and make that change. Like, so that's why I did Indie Bio. That's why I'm now at Mayfield to get more capital to be able to deploy into more entrepreneurs. Um, so that's it. It's, it's to grow the mission. Thank you for asking. Oh, thanks. Thanks to you. Mm -hmm. So the entrepreneurship of journey is so difficult. How do you know uh, when you need to stay with your conviction and plow forward and uh, when you need to pivot? It's a, you know, uh, there's the trite answer, which is always, you know, bite down on your mouthpiece and move forward, uh, you know, and never quit, blah, blah, blah. But, and then there's the, the real answer, the human answer, which is, look, I understand things are hard. And, uh, you know, I think you should, 
you know, rule number one, don't die, right? Like rule number two, get the best deal you can. Rule number three, if you can't get a great deal and you can't find a pivot, time is the most important thing in life, not money. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's use that time. That's an opportunity cost of time. Set a deadline. In six months, if I don't hit traction, I will go do something else. Pivots are along that way, right? Like that's just business building. And so, I, you know, it's, it's harder to address in an answer like this, but that terminal point is something that no one addresses. And so, and, and I, I've invested enough entrepreneurs to know that like, it can be emotionally hard to let go of the startup that you started and admit defeat and all of those things. But if you don't do so, it keeps you from going out and getting the next success. My partner at Mayfield Urshit, very successful entrepreneur, his first three companies died. So Arvind, you invest in, you know, throughout the range. You're working with very early scientists and spinning companies out to writing later stage checks. At that very early stage, what are the signals you're looking for in your CEO? Um, which, you know, team is everything. Oh man, this is getting to the, to the secrets. The secrets. I'm, I'm digging in, Arvind. I know, Victoria. And you know where to dig. Um, the number one thing that I'm looking for is a deep responsiveness to, um, to, the, to, to the engagement that we have. What do I mean by that? It's like, if I, you know, the follow-up, because you never, you never make a deal in, a, in one meeting, right? So there's gonna be a follow-up. If that follow-up doesn't include feedback, it doesn't include like a, a thoughtful integration of our conversation into some sort of uh, reflection, but it's a pass, almost for sure. Um, if there is that thoughtfulness, I want to start to dig in. And, and it's because, and, and this is a stylistic thing. I'm a very early stage investor, whether the check size is $8 million or 250K, it's still going to be very early. So I need to know that I can work with a founder very deeply. If like later stage investors, Series B, C, they, they don't, they're not going to say that, what I just said, right? So, and there's other early stage investors that they don't want to talk to CEOs. <laughs> like, you know, just here, take my money and make it more. Um, you know, I think, so this is a very personal, um, you know, sort of question about my, who, who I am. And so, and, and then the other thing is someone who is constantly trying to think bigger, um, you know, layer, like what is the bigger impact that this could have while being able to keep their focus on that first value inflection point. That's a very rare quality to be able to see the forest and the trees at the same time, or at least be able to zoom back and forth between the two. So all these entrepreneurs on the call, you know, they're looking for, uh, for investment. They're looking for strategic partnerships. How do, you, how do they approach an investor like you? Because um, I'm sure you get, you get hit up all the time. Email me. I, sure. But that doesn't mean that I'm finding great companies all the time, right? Like that's, that's the myth. It's like, man, you know, I'm investing. I went from investing in 60 companies a year through IndieBio, New York, and SF to three, maybe four. Um, and so you, you know, like the, the secret is if you hit my inbox, I read it. It's pretty simple, right? Like my inbox is not like any, any good VC, the inbox is their business, right? And so it's not like, you know, bad VCs will skip a bunch of stuff and like, you know, or purely look for signal. I think the best companies that I've looked at are inbound to my inbox, not through, like either through a founder intro or a cold outreach. Actually, as I think about it, it may feel, especially it may like, I, obviously in the bio, that's 100% of the end of what's going on because it's an application. At Mayfield, I have a blend and uh, the, the deals that I'm doing and get, yeah. So email people directly, have a good one-liner. Tell me your problem, right? Like you have the outline now. Mm -hmm. um, are there any major differences between a biotech companies in different categories, such as, you know, alternative uh, plant-based protein, medical and materials in terms of how you look at key metrics um, for de-risking, growth strategies and, and expectations? Formula is different. 
No, I mean, I think the, the question really is, is the CEO someone who could build a product and build a company? Is there, is there movement on the product that, that kind of like, you know, whether it's a therapeutic where you have, you know, some in vitro or in vivo data, if it's food, can we, can we taste it? <laughs> like it's, okay. it's pretty simple, right. To the, to the uh, phase you're at, um, you know, if it's a clean energy thing, uh, you know, again, more metrics that understand what the cost of good, like how, how does the, how does the uh, socio, or I mean, sorry, techno economic analysis play out. So I think it's all fairly um, intuitive. The easiest way to think about it is if you were, and it takes some self um, awareness to be able to do this, but if you can just put your investor hat on and say, what would it take for me to invest in this? If I had a million dollars, what would you want to see? That's your milestones or an easier way to do it. If you asked your, your parents or your mom for her life savings and you had to, you were convincing your mom, someone you care about, right? To put their life savings into this company, what would they? What would you want to show them to to say that you're not going to lose their life savings? Hey, you start to get milestones pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I want to end on, the, on this one note. Um, tell a personal quick story: base jumping, you deciding to know that you don't want to die. Hey, How sure. is that relating to entrepreneurship? Help us end on a high note. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what Victoria is alluding to is a chapter in this book. <laughs> coding the world. And, um, and I talk about my time as a base jumper and, uh, and really finding my purpose at that time. And, um, and I think that's the, that's the number one thing that could, that, that really help you right in your journey. You guys are all young and, and, um, and have a lot of incredible life ahead of you. And, uh, and so in terms of entrepreneurship, right? Like that, that North star is everything. And um, because it can never be taken from you, right? Your company could, could die and not work, but it doesn't take your purpose from you. Right. And that's, what's so powerful about it. And um, yeah, I think if you just go in and say, look, I know the change I want to create in the world. You come to me as a VC and you're, you're, you know, you come to a VC and you're like, I know what the change I'm going to create in the world and we're going to do it through this company. And this is how uh, it's like, okay, here, take, you know, how much do you want? Right. Um, and that's the thing that you want to really, as an entrepreneur, continue to, um, to focus on. Uh, and that will lead you to all, all answers in a sense. Um, so yeah, you don't need to go risk your life to find it. <laughs> you know, like, I think like that's the most important part. Just all you got to do to find it is, is, you know, take a shower or do whatever it is that you do to, to be in a quiet place. For me, it's the only place I'm ever alone is a shower. So like, um, reflect on, on what it is that you, that would make you proud. Uh, my wife and I use what we call the 20 year rule on all decisions in 20 years. What would we remember? Right. A or B. And I think like, that's the, that's driven so many great, great outcomes for our family. Uh, and like, and it's always led us to do the harder thing, but the more memorable thing. I am always so energized walking away from our conversation <laughs> and full of ideas and want to do a bunch of stuff. Um, so I, 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 I'm sure the finalists feel that way as well, the awesome. founders on this call. Um, I just want to thank you, Arvin, for spending your time and sharing these nuggets of gold. Um, and, you know, one or more or many companies on this call will become, right, the unicorns, the big impact makers. Right. Um, and we're, we couldn't be more excited. And thank you for your ardent support of XTC. It's been, it's been so awesome. My pleasure. And Victoria, um, let everyone know they're free to email me. Hustle your way into my inbox. All right. We'll, we'll keep hustling. Thanks, Arvin. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.